So welcome to the 35th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Axel Brandeberg from Narvita in Stockholm. He got his PhD from the University of Helsinki in 1990. Then he had postdoctoral training for two years at Narvita in Copenhagen, and then uh, for two years at High Altitude Observatory at National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder. He, uh, he got a faculty position, Nordic assistant professor at Narvita in 1994. He moved to, to uh, University of Newcastle upon Tyne uh, in uh, 1996 as a professor of applied mathematics. And he returned to Narvita in 2000 and uh, was the professor there since then. He is also an affiliate uh, member at KTH Royal Institute of Technology and Stockholm University. Uh, between 2010 and 2015, he was a deputy director of Narvita and between 2015 and 2018, a visiting professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. In 2014, he was elected as a foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. In 2019, he became an honorary professor at Ilya State University in Belize, Georgia. He served, uh, he serves, I should say, since 2010 as uh, a member of the editorial board of Astronomische Nachrichten. Uh, his research interests are very wide, generically astrophysical fluid dynamics, astrobiology, solar cell activity, all kinds of uh, applications of hydrodynamics. He is one of the original authors of the famous Pencil Code and a member of the Pencil Code collaboration. And today he will be talking about helical magnetic fields in the early universe. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Axel. Thanks very much, uh, Igor, for your very kind introduction. And um, I'm happy to speak to you here today. And it's a great opportunity to connect borders through Zoom during Corona times. Great. So what I will be talking today is about is helical magnetic fields in the early universe. Um, magnetic helicity is an important quantity. So let me first explain what it is. Uh, magnetic helicity has also been uh, quite uh, a challenge to people in dynamo theory, one of my basic uh, strong interests before I came to understanding and studying the uni early universe was uh, dynamo theory in various astrophysical settings. And there uh, was really, a, for, since the 1990s, a myth about, the, about what is known as catastrophic qu quenching of the dynamo effect. And so that again is related to magnetic helicity. And, uh, uh, telling you about this or showing you th uh, this really it gives you an idea of how strong a conserved quantity magnetic helicity really is in practice. Magnetic helicity also plays an important role in decaying turbulence and that obviously is relevant to the early universe because uh, early universe uh, MHD magnetic fields uh, would only be decaying in the time after its generation. One of the mechanisms that has been discussed for generating the magnetic field is the so-called chiral magnetic effect. So I will be uh, focusing on that one today as one of the mechanisms that could explain early universe magnetic fields. And then I will turn to gravitational waves that could also be generated from the resulting Reynolds and Maxwell stresses from that turbulence. So I will uh, tell you a little bit about such signatures, which also include uh, signatures about helicity. So the word helicity comes from the Greek word elix, and uh, it really refers to uh, curl-like structures like these beautiful ones, these beautiful plants, and also similarly for uh, various types of life in, on, at the, in the macroscopic world. There's of course also helicity at the microbiological world, uh, related to the question of homochorality, a very strong interest of myself also, but I will not have uh, time today to talk to you about that. So the term helicity in connection with uh, fluid dynamics and its uh, topological uh, underpinnings uh, really go back to the work of Keith Moffat of Cambridge uh, of the year 1969. He was the first to uh, realize that this integral U which is the velocity dotted into the vorticity, the curl of U, 
is a, a quantity that can be related to the linkage of vortex tubes, vortex filaments. And this is uh, really the first paper that really put that, uh, uh, made, put that um, it, very clearly in writing. And so one of the things you realize is that if you have uh, structures such as vortex structures, and the same applies to magnetic fields, if, but if you have a vortex loop, which uh, cause, has to do with the vorticity, uh, which is aligned with a structure and then forms a tube-like structure, once these uh, structures are interlinked and um, therefore crossing here in projection, it, you have a linkage between these two tubes and, and only when you have that, this integral that I showed you a moment ago is actually different from zero. So if these loops were disconnected, if they were not interlocked, the, magnet, the kinetic helicity would be zero. You can have a variety of different uh, not like structures. Here, for example, is a, um, another complicated lock, uh, knot which has, in this case, a linkage number of three. Uh, or strictly speaking, three halves, uh, but uh, it leads to three times the, the helicity in this case is three times um, the, the flux squared. In, uh, so he was, Moffat was really the first to term the, uh, to coin the term helicity in the connection, in connection with hydrodynamics and also magnetohydrodynamics a bit later. In fact, he said in his 69 paper that the term magnetic helicity is used in particle physics for the scalar product of the momentum and the spin of a particle. And we'll come to that also in a moment. And it would seem to be a natural candidate in the present context to describe the quantity u dot omega uh, over the volume. The quantity may then be described as the helicity per unit volume of the flow. So this was uh, the beginning of uh, helicity in the studies of fluid dynamics and then also in connection with magnetohydrodynamics. In connection with magnetohydrodynamics, uh, which I'm talking about here, the helicity, the magnetic helicity is defined as the dot product of the uh, magnetic field with its vector potential. So A, uh, the curl of A gives again the magnetic field. So it's somewhat different from the current helicity, from the kinetic helicity that I showed you a moment ago, where we had um, the velocity and the curl of the velocity. And in fact, one should really say that, the, um, that this quantity here is a quantity that describes uh, the magnetic field. So you have to take the um, inverse um, curl of the magnetic field. And likewise, in the previous case, it was the helicity, not of the velocity, but it's the helicity of the vorticity. And that's why I also talked about vortex structures. So here we talk about magnetic structures. And again, we have a pair of interlocked flux rings. Flux is the quantity phi, which uh, can be calculated for a cross section of uh, through the magnetic uh, through a magnetic uh, flux strength, strand. So this is a structure where individual magnetic field vectors would all be aligned with the structure, and those all together would form a ring. And this is indeed uh, often seen also in, in actual simulations these days, and uh, also in solar physics, we see often magnetic flux structures. Here again, these two structures are interlocked, and we can now calculate this volume integral of a dot b by splitting it up into two different types of integrals. One is the integral over a along, a along the flux line. So let's talk about this one first. So this is the integral over the volume, uh, over the volume, uh, over the volume v two here. So it's actually this integral. So we are looking, talking about the. Uh, <clears throat> this integral along the line. Um, let me just uh, make sure I'm getting this right here. So we are talking about the line L1. Uh, so it is actually this one. So it's, it uh, was slightly confused here. So we are calculating um, the integral A dot L along this line. 
So this has nothing to do with any magnetic flux quite yet, but it is a line integral of A along this line. And now using Stokes theorem, you can turn that into a surface integral, but now it would be a surface integral over the surface S2. So it's not explicitly shown here, but this would be the surface that would be marked by this line L1. So it's this entire surface here. Now there is no magnetic field there, and therefore it reduces actually to the surface integral over the only place where there is a magnetic field, which is here. So you have therefore the flux, which is the same along each position of the flux line uh, for the second loop. So therefore, uh, this first integral gives you the flux phi two for the second loop. Now the second integral is straightforwardly the loop, uh, the integral directly of, uh, of, the, of the B field uh, everywhere for, this, for the same volume. And it is therefore the surface integral over the surface S2. So now we have calculated one part of the integral and we obtained uh, uh, the value phi one, phi two times phi two, but only once. But we have two structures. We talked about this structure only, but we have also a second structure. But by the same argument, we can calculate this product again. And therefore we obtain twice the product of these two fluxes. Now, if you were to interchange the orientation of one of these uh, magnetic field directions, the sign also of the helicity would change. So it's a signed quantity. And then you would have minus twice phi one, phi two. So it's a quantity that describes the linkage. If they were not interlocked, you wouldn't have gotten anything in between and the uh, integral would really be zero. So this is an, uh, a quantitatively exact calculation. My derivation was a little bit uh, hand waving because it assumed that uh, this decomposition would be uh, orthogonal, but it is also a correct calculation if you, if you do it properly. So the unit of the magnetic helicity is of, of the flux squared. So often in solar physics, when people tell you something about magnetic helicity, they talk, talk about Maxwell squared. So in the sun, for example, we know pretty much that the magnetic field of the sun involves something like 10 to the 46 Maxwell squared. Now, what produces magnetic helicity in astrophysical, in uh, contemporary astrophysical set settings? This I can best explain by looking at uh, the at geophysics, where we have the Earth, where we have very much the same phenomenology. Uh, ending then, we have vorticity here. We have no magnetic fields in this case, um, but we do have uh, different situations in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. So this is something that will be different in the early universe where we have just one helicity, if at all. So in the in contemporary astrophysical and geophysical settings, what causes here in the uh, what is it, what causes helicity in uh, geophysics and also solar physics is simply the fact that we have uh, gravity, which points uh, into the sun into the Earth here, and we have rotation. Now rotation is pointing uh, along the, to the towards the North Pole whereas uh, gravity points towards the center. Uh, these are opposite directions in the Northern Hemisphere, and that's why the kinetic helicity is negative in the Northern Hemisphere. That's simply because also G dot omega is negative. Note that G is a proper vector. Omega, the angular velocity, is a pseudo vector, so its dot product is a pseudo scalar, which then changes its sign in the Southern Hemisphere, but both have the same direction. At the equator, helicity would then be zero locally. So let me uh, say just one slide worth of uh, catastrophic quenching, which really made it very, very clear uh, already since the uh, very early 2000s that magnetic helicity really does play a, um, a tremendously important role in numerical simulations. When I say numerical simulations, I should uh, qualify this here by emphasizing that I'm talking about uh, peri periodic boxes. Periodic boxes is a situation where magnetic helicity really is fully conserved. And that's because, uh, so a dot, the integral over a dot b is really just minus twice 
the diffusivity times j dot b. There's no other term in this case, and that's because uh, it's a closed volume. There's no surface terms here, making the situation very simple. That also, of course, explains why there is a difference between periodic boxes and real astrophysical systems, where we do have uh, fluxes of magnetic helicity, but I will not talk about those here today. So keep in mind that what I'm telling you here about catastrophic quenching, which really has caused a headache uh, to much of the dynamo community in the mid 90s, it really has to do with periodic boxes. So it does, uh, what it actually means in practice uh, is quite nicely illustrated here by successful dynamo simulations in a periodic box with silicity. So uh, what it actually means in this case is that the magnetic energy, B squared here, magnetic energy density, can still grow in, as a function of time, but the time scale on which it can grow, and actually to a relatively large values, uh, is a microphysical molecular or atomic diffusive value. So the time scale on which the magnetic field can grow into saturation becomes progressively longer, slower, as you make the microphysical diffusivity smaller and smaller. So in real astrophysical settings, it is a small quantity. And in fact, uh, already in, um, in simulations of moderate size of even just uh, 32 cubes, so here's, for example, shown a simulation of uh, 32 mesh points cubed, very, very cheap, and uh, nowadays it's ridiculously cheap. But once you go to 128 cubed, uh, that's this one, you begin to see that the saturation is not an immediate one. And in fact, uh, the actual fit uh, is a perfect fit to this kind of saturation behavior. So the saturation of the large scale magnetic field, which is called B bar, and this can be, uh, um, is, is given by uh, the magnetic field energy at the small scales, multiplied by the ratio of the wave number at which energy is being ejected, the forcing wave number, Kf, divided by the smallest wave number of the domain, K1, which could be equal to one in a periodic box of size two pi. But then uh, this is not really reached in, in instantaneously. It's actually only reached at a microphysical diffusive time scale. And these are the fits which are shown as a dashed line and they are in all cases perfect fits. So you see, for example, here in this simulation uh, with a much higher Reynolds number, that it became uh, extremely computationally expensive to actually reach the uh, final saturation. So this explains also why people, uh, when they do dynamo simulations and uh, are not aware of this, uh, using immediately the highest possible resolution may not actually have a successful dynamo or may not have realized that there's a successful dynamo because the magnetic field would be very, very small still uh, at short, on short time scales, and it really needs to run for a ridiculously long time scale. I should also say that in many numerical simulations when, uh, of astrophysical uh, contemporary uh, type, people are actually ignoring magnetic uh, diffusivity altogether, and then you can never reach saturation. So you see here how important it actually is to retain magnetic diffusivity. So now we will come to the early universe. If there are any questions at this point already, let me know. And please interrupt me if you want. What, what is catastrophic? Catastrophic uh, refers to the fact that the microphysical value plays a decisive role. And this value is very, very small in astrophysics. So it would be a catastrophe in that sense if uh, eta was really equal to zero, because if it was equal to zero, then you have one minus one and you wouldn't see that the magnetic field is actually, could actually ever be finite. So it, uh, it was Eric Blackman uh, back in 2000 or 2001 who called it catastrophic quenching. Uh, before that time, uh, people have uh, realized that, um, or have, have tried to uh, calculate what is known as an alpha effect. Uh, there is an uh, analogy between alpha effect and the chiral magnetic effect I will be talking about later. But this alpha effect is a, micro, is a macro physical effect uh, playing a role at the level of uh, averaging over the scale of turbulent eddies. 
And in that case, uh, this alpha effect, which uh, can explain the growth of a mean field, a large scale magnetic field, would be quenched to zero if there is, a, if, a, if one had a fully periodic uh, domain. Does this uh, answer your question? And are there any other questions? Just let me know. Okay, I will. Thank you. So uh, in the early universe, uh, we have somewhat uh, different situations. And uh, it was my pleasure to be at Norita at the time when I had the, the opportunity to work together with people in high energy physics, uh, Carl, Carrie Enquist and, and Paul Olson, who were at the time very concerned about the idea that if we had a mechanism that could produce magnetic fields in the early universe, this would happen at very, very small length scales. And um, at, at the end of those years, I knew already about uh, the concept of an inverse cascade. And that what that means is that magnetic energy could actually, and that requires helicity, could actually inversely uh, trans uh, cascade to larger and larger length scales, as opposed to a direct cascade or a forward cascade, where all the energy that is injected into the system is being forwardly propagated into even smaller length scales. So it is important to realize that in the early universe, and these are the times after the electroweak phase transition, that's when the universe was about 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11 seconds old. Uh, the universe was uh, perfectly conducting at the time, uh, highly collisional, and therefore magnetohydrodynamics is actually applicable. There is another uh, an enormously useful concept that was really only put forward in, in our joint paper at the time. And that is to say that the um, equations of magnetohydrodynamics in an expanding universe, where you have uh, the universe expanding at a, at a rate A, which is proportional to time to the one half, um, can actually be rewritten in a form uh, that is equivalent to those of the relativistic MHG equations in a non-expanding universe. Uh, here you saw in these equations here, you see no expansion factor, no A or uh, no R. RV is the expansion term here. And by using correspondingly rescaled quantities with the tilde, tilde variables, and you use conformal time, uh, which is uh, dt uh, uh, divided by the scale factor integrated, uh, then these equations become completely independent of the scale factor. This was a tremendous uh, simplification because it meant that uh, in those years already, people could easily do simulations of the expanding universe uh, at the time with uh, all the standard MHD knowledge that was available at, in those years. I mentioned just a moment ago uh, the inverse cascade, and I also briefly said that it should be contrasted against the forward cascade. A forward cascade is what Kolmogorov basically proposed. So Kolmogorov's concept of turbulence was that energy is ejected at some length scale, and all the energy would propagate to smaller and smaller length scales or higher wave numbers. That's simply because the interactions in the Navier-Stokes equation in the hydrodynamic equations are nonlinear, and any nonlinearity produces um, uh, energy at, uh, at a higher wave, wave factor. So the energy in K after a quadratic interaction would become twice K, of course. And so it would gradually step by step propagate to higher wave numbers. Uh, the flux along that cascade, and that was another important realization, is actually a constant independent of wave number. And because of that, you can even calculate the entire spectrum based on just dimensional arguments. Uh, e is the spectrum, the magnetic uh, or the kinetic energy spectrum. And it's defined in such a way that the integral over E is equal to the RMS velocity squared times a half. It therefore has uh, the energy of uh, centimeter squared per second squared multiplied by a uh, by another length scale squared. So it's therefore because of one over k. So it therefore has the units of centimeters cubed divided by second squared. Epsilon is the flux of energy. And so it has energy, it has 
uh, uh, the units of energy per unit time. That means it has units of uh, sec centimeter squared uh, divided by a second cubed. So by just putting in the arguments, the uh, dimensions here, you find immediately that the exponent on epsilon must be equal to a plus two third, and the exponent uh, on k must be equal to minus uh, five third, multiplied by an unknown Kolmogorov constant, which turned out to be not so far away from unity, it turned out to be approximately 1.6. So this gives you the famous Kolmogorov k to the minus five third, third energy spectrum. This should be contrasted to the situation of uh, magnetic helicity, where it is in fact possible to have an inverse cascade, as was realized by Uriel Frisch uh, since, uh, 19, uh, since 1975. It becomes most prominent, this inverse cascade, if you expose it to a circumstance of not driven turbulence, but actually decaying turbulence. So energy, decaying turbulence means you just put in energy, and this is this pink line here, in a spectrum versus wave number, initially. And these are the simulations from our old paper with uh, Christensen and Heidmarsh in 2001. You put in energy initially at small length scales. So it has a peak at, the, at uh, high wave numbers, uh, such that it's still resolved within uh, the discretization scheme. It then turns out, and that is simply the result of numerical simulations at the time, 2001, that the energy then gradually uh, changes in such, that the spectrum changes in such a way that the peak propagates gradually to uh, smaller and smaller wave numbers. At the same time, the magnetic energy at small wave numbers, large length scales, is indeed increasing. So we have a real increase of the magnetic energy at high wave, at uh, uh, large length scales, small wave numbers. That is what is called an inverse cascade. In the absence of helicity, it, you don't have that. You have a, at most a very, very small inverse cascade. So it is actually real uh, that we saw already back then, but, uh, but it is much, much smaller. They will also not talk about this today. An argument for the decay rate of the energy or the increase, the rate at which the, the wave number here it decreases or the length scale increases can be given by, uh, was given first by Biscam and Müller in 1999. So here the idea is uh, that the helicity is, a, is really a, a conserved quantity, it's fully constant. The um, rate of energy dissipation, so the energy would not be constant but the energy will be dissipate and it would dissipate at a turbulent uh, rate. So that means it's proportional to only macrophysical quantities, which again on dimensional arguments must be equal to the velocity to the third power divided by the length scale, divided by the length scale to the first power or uh, correspondingly magnetic energy uh, to the three halves power. So uh, energy can be expressed in uh, units of uh, an Alvin speed, and it would then have the units, uh, we would then need to raise it to the, so it would have units of centimeters squared per second squared, and to get the velocity of a, the unit of velocity, you have to raise it to the power three halves to get a velocity unit. So the rate at which the energy would change, dE by dt, it would decay, so that's why we have a minus sign, would be equal to the energy to the three halves power divided by L. And now we can actually use this uh, law of conserved helicity again to uh, substitute for E in terms of L or for L in terms of E. So here we ha still have uh, E to the three halves divided by L, but now we can substitute for L uh, again, the helicity, which is constant, multiplied by E to the minus one. And therefore, you have uh, altogether an e to the three halves power divided by helicity. If you integrate this uh, ordinary differential equation in, in time, dE by dt equals to minus uh, e to the five third power, you obtain that the energy must decay like t to the minus three halves. What I haven't written down here is that L correspondingly must increase like t to the plus two third power such that the product of uh, E and L is again a constant.
Any questions on this? Actually, Axel, I do have a question about this. Yes. So this is the uh, evolution when you have magnetic helicity. Yes. Uh, what about if you have uh, hydrodynamic uh, velocity type of helicity? Is excellent. the same argument true? No, excellent question. Uh, it is not true, actually. And the reason uh, for that, I need to go back to this page here. So remember, the in, in this case, the decay rate of magnetic helicity is proportional to the so-called current helicity. And this one has only has a, a factor in B, which is like energy, and one derivative of the B field. So uh, that means that if you make the diffusivity smaller and smaller, uh, that I didn't write down, if you make uh, eta smaller and smaller, J increases, but only to eta to the plus one half power. And so that means that as uh, the product altogether, so this altogether decays, uh, increases, like eta to the minus one half power. So if eta becomes smaller, it increases. Uh, but because of this eta factor here, this entire quantity still decreases if uh, eta becomes smaller. So therefore, in the limit of small eta, this is a conserved quantity. By contrast, uh, the kinetic helicity would be u dot omega. And then you would have on the right-hand side uh, the velocity derivative uh, uh, instead of uh, um, uh, instead of the, so you would have the uh, velocity here, or you would have the vorticity here, but you would have, so this would then be the vorticity, uh, like because this is vorticity and this is the velocity, but here instead you would have the nabla squared, del squared of the uh, of the velocity. And that again also increases, but now it increases uh, proportional to eta, uh, to the viscosity. So you would have a viscosity factor here. And then the vorticity itself increases with, um, with, what, with decreasing uh, kinetic viscosity. And therefore, this entire term would actually uh, increase like the viscosity to the uh, minus one half power. The viscosity goes to zero, this goes to infinity, uh, for the kinetic helicity. And therefore, kinetic helicity, even in the best limit, would just never be conserved in practice unless it is exactly equal to zero. In that case, you would have zero uh, multiplied by infinity, uh, which of course in reality is also going to inf uh, infinity because it increases faster. Um, but uh, that is a dramatic difference between kinetic helicity and magnetic helicity. Yes, thanks for the question. And I didn't have a corresponding ludograph from this. Any other questions? Uh, there were no others in the chat or anywhere, so I'll let you know. OK, great. Uh, just a brief comment here about the dif differences between uh, decaying simulations, which I, uh, of which I showed a moment ago some pictures, and forced turbulence, which uh, also many people uh, practice in numerical astrophysical, astrophysics. If you have, uh, this I explained already, if you have a decaying a helical turbulence, you get an inverse cascade quite nicely, and it looks like this. If you did the same thing with force turbulence, uh, you would have a forcing at a high wave number. You would get something like a Kolmogorov spectrum at higher wave numbers. And uh, what then would happen is you would have a bit of a bump traveling to the left but it would then lead to a saturation at the smallest length scale. People call it or sometimes a condensation uh, at the smallest length scale. And that's how uh, for force turbulence, the inverse cascade would look like. Uh, decaying hydrodynamic simulations, also uh, uh, non-helical MHG simulations, non-helical magnetic fields here, would lead to a very weak inverse cascade and the energy would decrease. So here, and in, in, in fact, that's very clearly so that uh, at a better resolution, the bump would always stay strictly at the same height. So this uh, in, the, in forced uh, in decaying uh, non-helical simulations, it would decrease this bump. And then in forced simulations, you would eventually have a, a steady state. This is here for the kinetic energy. You get a Kolmogorov spectrum if you drive the kinetic energy in this case, um, not, a, not a magnetic field. And then you have a dynamo effect, um, which means that also the magnetic energy M, the solid line here, uh, increases as a function of time until it reaches saturation. So this is the full spectrum of what people can see in periodic box simulations, either forced or decaying or 
helical or non-helical. So that's the full range of uh, what people have explored so far. So we will be talking about this situation here where we talk about decaying uh, helical turbulence. In fact, it turns out, uh, this may have been already obvious to some people, uh, that the decay uh, in decaying turbulence can actually be a self-similar process. And that what it means is that the magnetic energy spectrum, which uh, is of course a function of two parameters, k and t, can actually be written as a function of just t alone. And this can be done by a scaling function phi, which would be just equal to the spectrum, but the spectrum multiplied by the correlation length, uh, psi sub m, which is the weighted integral of the inverse wave number, weighted with the energy spectrum divided by the uh, divided by the total energy, which is the integral over the spectrum. So this is a quantity that would increase. I just said a moment ago, I called it sub capital L back, back then. It would increase this time to proportional to teach the two third power. So that means if you multiply it by K and the spectrum shifts further to the right, it, you would reshift it back always to the position unity. So this is a scaling function, which is a, a non-dimensional function of this product here. But then it can actually decay, like in the helical case, in non-helical cases. Uh, and again, you can compensate for that by uh, introducing ex an exponent. So in our non-helical case, this exponent would be zero. So if beta is equal to zero in the non-helical case, you have a decay of the energy, P, um, proportional to uh, T to the minus uh, uh, exponent P to the two-third power. By contrast, in, um, in non-helical turbulence, we have either a two or a one exponent here, so the uh, spectrum is decaying, uh, and then the exponents would be correspondingly different. And those are all, it can all be explained by certain conserved quantities. Here in this case, it's a magnetic uh, helicity density. In the hydrodynamic case, it's the so-called Luzanski integral, and this was, goes all back to a paper by uh, myself and Tina Karnashvili of 2017, where the details are explained. And uh, also, in this case, we can have a quantity which is the projected vector potential squared, uh, projected along local magnetic field lines, which is a, a potentially a conserved quantity. So here are the corresponding plots, uh, but at now at much higher resolution uh, than what was possible back in 2001. Here we see a 1024 cube simulation where we see that the bump really has, strictly speaking, the same height. You can then rescale it so that the bump would always be at the same position at approximately unity. And you can determine then very nicely the spectral shapes, which are proportional to k to the fourth power for the inverse cascade, and you have a corresponding spectrum here. And you see also that the exponents that I uh, defined up here, the exponent um, on the energy, which uh, you can obtain as a function of time, it's an instantaneous scaling exponent, would then be uh, given by the logarithmic derivative of the um, energy versus logarithmic time, and likewise for the length scale. So in fact, I thought I got a minus sign here. So P is defined positive and this one is decaying, but here this is with a plus sign, so that is correct. So we see then uh, that in the helical case, we have an inverse cascade, we get a universal scaling function phi, um, and uh, we also get universal scaling functions for non-helical MHD decay and non-helical hydrodynamic decay. And again, we have a very reasonably well, and certainly here very well, a very nice, uh, collapse of the data. And furthermore, we see that the instantaneous scaling exponents P and Q uh, in a parametric representation of P versus Q obtain universal points in, in this uh, self-similarity plot. So for all the fully helical solutions end up at this point, larger symbols mean later time, all the non-helical ones end up th at this point where beta is equal to one and the um, non-helical hydrodynamic simulations and also helical hydrodynamic simulations, which doesn't make much of a difference, uh, end up to be close to four, but some often actually closer to three with the beta. All right. So now I'll talk about the chiral magnetic effect. The chiral magnetic effect also produces helical magnetic fields, 
and it is related to the uh, chirality of fermions. Chirality of fermions is a property of, uh, of fermions that have uh, been produced, for example, by the uh, beta decay. If you have a neutron, a, a neutron decaying on a time scale of every 10 minutes, it sheds an electron which has its uh, momentum in the opposite direction as the as a spin. So I talked about that already in the very beginning when this uh, handedness of fermions was actually used as a description of a corresponding pseudoscalar in the hydrodynamics and, uh, and magnetohydrodynamics. Electrons typically have a, a left-handedness, which means that the momentum and the spin point in opposite directions, whereas positrons are right-handed and uh, have an aligned uh, arrangements between the two. This is true uh, for high energies, and that's therefore true in, uh, at, uh, at uh, high temperatures uh, relevant to the early universe, when the uh, possibility of spin flipping is ne almost negligible. Spin flipping would be a, a possibility when the fermions would, uh, have, would not have a very strong momentum. You could imagine that the observer would overtake the fermion and would obviously then see uh, these spins being flipped. That's simply a, 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 a result of the observer uh, seeing the electron differently. Uh, but this causes an important coupling also with uh, electromagnetic fields. And this is called the chiral magnetic effect. I don't have the full history and the literature here on this, but uh, it was, of course, discovered by Vilenkin back in 1980s. And it uh, has been rediscovered in many different forms over the uh, subsequent dec decades. And there's many excellent review papers on this. I will not uh, go into uh, the full details, but let me just explain that uh, it in particular causes an, um, a proportionality between the current density and the magnetic field through a factor that is uh, obviously a pseudoscalar, and it is related to the number difference of left-handed minus right-handed fermions. Once you have such an imbalance, there would be a current which uh, would be in a particular direction, depending on whether you have uh, left-handed or right-handed fermions. So in this case, if, the, if you have a left-handed one, uh, then the, uh, it would cause a current, I believe that uh, according to this definition, there must be a minus sign here. Uh, it would cause a, uh, a current which would then go in the opposite direction as a magnetic field. If that's the case, we have in, uh, a new term in the induction equation. I should also emphasize uh, that this term is often with a different normalization called mu5 for the people familiar with the chiral magnetic effect. But here we have used a non-dimensional version of, the, uh, of, the, of mu in such a way that the units of mu is that of a wave number, k. And so by after inserting this, you can easily uh, see that even in the absence of any velocities, um, the induction equation, which is here the uncurled version of the induction equation in terms of its vector potential, it can become unstable if mu is large enough and in fact larger than k. Uh, I forgot an eta factor, I just realized here outside. So. Uh, there should also be an eta factor, eta factor here in our normalization. And then when eta is larger than the wave number, or in other words, if the wave number is smaller than your uh, chemical chiral potential, mu, then you would have a destabilization at all wave numbers smaller, um, smaller than or equal to mu. And that we will see in just a moment, uh, where I will show the numerical simulations of, uh, uh, of uh, such a system. Before coming to that, let me explain uh, that there is a conservation law, which is a modified uh, conservation law of the usual magnetic helicity, and it is uh, obtained by dotting this equation, the induction equation, with the magnetic field, and you obtain the usual conservation law for A dot B, where this leads to the diffusion term, which uh, leads then to minus twice uh, eta times J 
which would be the current density is equal to uh, proportional to the curl of B, uh, dotted into this B. Uh, but then there is another term, namely the chemical chirochemical potential. It itself obeys a evolution equation. And depending on how much of a current helicity you produce, here's the current helicity, or how much um, uh, helicity, uh, magnetic helicity you produce, this is the same term here and here, uh, the more you would begin to deplete the chirochemical potential. So that means the more magnetic helicity you produce by this destabilizing magnetic field, uh, the more you actually begin to deplete the chirochemical potential in such a way that the sum of the in instantaneous magnetic and helicity density and the averaged volume averaged chirochemical potential is equal to a constant and equal to what we put in initially. So if you put in initially a chirochemical potential, then at all times, regardless of the even the microphysical diffusivity, and therefore in contrast to uh, the previous uh, case, where I had to assume that the eta was small, uh, here it is in fact valid for all etas, almost all etas. And what that means is uh, that the magnetic helicity uh, can be actually estimated in terms of the initial chirality. And that now means in particular that uh, the, for a fully helical field, which we will produce, the magnetic energy can be estimated in terms of um, uh, magnetic energy, magnetic energy density multiplied by the length scale, which has the same dimensions and also the same, almost the same value as A dot B, must be equal to mu naught, the initial chirochemical potential divided by lambda, uh, uh, would be factors of two, therefore a twiddle here. So that means that the magnetic energy by this effect can never become larger than an upper limit that is given by how much chirochemical potential we had initially and, and divided by this uh, evolution, by the speed of evolution, which is this lambda factor here. So this means that there is actually a limit on how much magnetic energy we can produce. Now we can uh, even just look at this quantity here and estimate it based on based on dimensional arguments. I think I had that. Um, well, let me just have a look here. Maybe I come to that actually in a moment. Yeah. Anyway, so the full ev evolution uh, system, of course, also involves the hydrodynamic equations and the continuity or energy equation, which means we start a simulation by putting in energy through the chirochemical potential, which would produce through this instability. It's similar to a dynamo instability. It would produce magnetic energy. It would also produce uh, kinetic energy, all of these would dissipate, and it would also even produce a large scale magnetic field. So there are different uh, regimes. I will only focus on, uh, and I will show both of these regimes. That depends simply on how big uh, the mu is and how big this lambda coefficient was. Remember, these are the two coefficients. Here is actually my uh, dimensional argument. No, it's not. So anyway, uh, based on dimensional arguments, we can estimate what the spectrum is. So we, what we want to explain here is uh, what happens when we inject energy at a wave number that, um, that is uh, less than mu. Remember, uh, all the wave numbers less than mu, and the fastest growth would be at mu divided by two, would grow exponentially in time. But then there would be a limit eventually when uh, the energy can no longer uh, grow exponentially. And that's when the energy can only go to a larger length scales because it must is forced to be inversely cascading. And so you would be going to a larger and larger energies and the spectrum, uh, according to a number of different simulations, including our own earlier ones, usually is a uh, rather steep spectrum, typically proportional to k to the minus two. And if that's the case, you can produce a uh, dimensional argument for the uh, uh, scaling law of the magnetic energy, which is just dependent on mu and eta and nothing else. Uh, in particular, mu lambda does not appear yet because lambda would only lead to the final saturation of the energy once this entire process has finished. And so this is a 
quantity, uh, quantity a scaling law, which numerically was confirmed and turns out uh, to give a scaling factor here, which is around 16. So it's larger than unity, but it is of order of unity in that sense. And uh, it pro really provides a uh, uh, quantitative estimate of how this scaling would appear. Then at large, uh, uh, at large times, you would have eventually saturation. And it can, it can be obtained by dimensional arguments. But now the dimensional argument must involve lambda, which is a quantity that leads to the feedback of or the, uh, the dilution of mu, the vector potential, the chemical potential, which is, of course, the source of everything, but it gets diluted or depleted. And you obtain now a, um, a scaling for E, which is equal to uh, mu divided by lambda and independent of wave number. Independent of wave number means that in a spectrum here, this is a sketch, the bump would just be, appear under a limit. And this limit is given by mu divided by lambda. In between, you have the scaling law. And so energy would really go uh, be injected here and would inversely cascade until it reaches saturation. So now I show this to you in action here. Here's a simulation in uh, color code of, of the vertical component of the magnetic field. Here's the corresponding spectrum. And you see that the energy increases first exponentially. It's small length scales. The field is already fully helical, but it's random at this point. But eventually, it reaches the scale of the domain. Once it reaches the scale of our Cartesian domain, it begins to feel the Cartesian geometry. And so it should not come as a surprise that in this particular simulation, we end up with a magnetic field that has a sinusoidal length scale depend, a sinusoidal dependence of one of the two components, Bz. I think it's Bx here, as a function of z. Uh, and there would be a corresponding B, uh, component By, which is phase shifted by 90 degrees and is proportional to the cosine. Uh, this would be proportional to the sine of z. And so therefore, the product of the two, um, uh, of the product of um, uh, A and, and B, uh, would be equal uh, to, uh, in other words, uh, the, uh, the the derivative, the curl of the magnetic field would be equal to the magnetic field itself, uh, or the uh, magnetic helicity um, is uh, fully helical. The magnetic field is fully helical. A and B are parallel to each other, and also B and J are proportional to each other. Here you see the other limit uh, where the magnetic energy, where lambda is small, and then the energy, then there would hardly be an inverse cascade. It would immediately go to the, uh, in, to the into the decaying phase, where the length scale is still increasing, uh, and energy then decreasing. Whereas here, energy was still increasing. So now, uh, uh, the dimensional argument really is uh, that uh, that you can explain that the product of magnetic field and length scale can just be explained by the temperature. And that's all. All the rest are just natural constants. Uh, it would be the uh, Boltzmann constant, the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and uh, sorry, the Boltzmann constant, and uh, and uh, h bar Planck constant and the speed of light. Based mm -hmm. on this alone, you obtain something which has the units of uh, ergs per cubic centimeter multiplied by centimeter, which is ergs per squared centimeter. So that's uh, the name of the game. And if you put in the uh, temperature of the universe as of today, you would obtain a value which would correspond to a helicity of 10 to the minus 18 Gauss, even less, uh, a Gauss squared multiplied by megaparsec. Uh, this G was a mistake here, should have been deleted. So this gives a relatively strong and stringent limit, which is, um, is relatively small compared to the so-called lower limits uh, of the magnetic fields that have been inferred from the non-observation of uh, secondary uh, uh, secondary uh, uh, GeV emission from blazars, from the halos of blazars. This leads to a, a limit on the product of the magnetic field and the length scale here in megaparsecs to the one half power. So the product again has the same units. So that would be a constant here along this line. Magnetic uh, square, field squared multiplied by length scale uh, being a, a, a conserved quantity. Our numerical limit was already slightly below or somewhat below a few order, orders of magnitude below this limit. 
so it would be perhaps uh, too weak to explain the magnetic, the lower limits on the magnetic field. Uh, but this uh, is just to see with some caveats because this was a relatively simplified uh, approach to this. And what I will address in the remaining few minutes is whether this chiral chemical effect could also produce and perhaps observationally relevant gravitational waves. So I will not have can, much on can, this. Can, can I ask a question? Yes. Please. Uh, this mu five or whatever, you assumed, in other words, that all electrons are left handed. Yes, right? yes, yes. So that's why. Which so is, of course, uh, huge. Uh, it's upper limit. Okay. Yes. So the number of degrees of freedom uh, was here assumed, of course, to be uh, three. In the early universe, it's larger. Um, and uh, because you have many more fermions also, that could lead to maybe a few orders of magnitude uh, change. But already, when you assume a G of 100 here, which we did for the early universe, but, uh, but then but uh, this is not we, this is this is not what I'm asking. I'm asking why would uh, electrons be uh, left-handed in the early universe? Yes, there should be a special mechanism for that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that is indeed another good question, um, and it is um, a, a hypothesis to some extent, which is uh, related to the fact that. Uh, uh, we must have some kind of imbalance in the, uh, in the uh, most likely in the Chan Simons number, in order to explain the imbalance between uh, matter and antimatter. Sure, so we would be small. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now it's not that small because it is uh, exactly what it would actually be sufficient in order to explain the corresponding change in the magnetic helicity. These are arguments that uh, Tanmay Vachas party who is either already in the audience or uh, is still at his doctor's appointment, uh, has been making since uh, over the last 20 years. So there is a connection between changes in the Chan Simons number and baryon synthesis. Yeah, sure. And so that's what, uh, what uh, one would be needing to allude to in this, in this scenario. There is apparently also a comment from Kohei. Please, yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I'd like to make a comment that so the in in New York case of, of the, the you know, wait, in realistic model of, of our universe, the, the right-handed electrons are, are relatively the, the, the less interact less interacting particles, so that it is easy, easier to, to remain remain uh, conserved. So that the, it would be not not left-handed electron, but right-handed electron would be, be better to be used. And uh, so for some some uh, some some mechanism in the, the arena, such as uh, gut biogenesis, with, with some some a bit bit technical implementation, but uh, it might be possible to generate large light hand electron non asymmetry. Just a comment. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you very much, Koi, uh, for a very important remark. That's uh, great, and helping me out here. So um, uh, the idea of uh, gravitational waves relevant to cosmology has a long history. Uh, here in this case, it was motivated by uh, by inflation. Uh, but what we are doing here, and this is just a few more transparencies that I will be showing here, uh, we are looking at the magnetic stress, BIBJ, and it would source gravitational waves, the uh, transverse uh, traceless uh, projection of it. And we calculated those in, um, in recent work uh, with my former PhD student, uh, uh, Alberto Ropa, and we found uh, that there is a direct correspondence between the spectrum of the magnetic field and the spectrum of gravitational waves, EGW, which um, corresponds, where we have a correspondence between a K to the minus five third energy spectrum for the magnetic field and uh, would expect a corresponding spectrum for the gravitational waves of K to the minus 11 third. Uh, there is another important uh, detail, uh, namely that the, in the sub inertial range, there is not a case, uh, case k to the fourth multiplied by uh, or divided by k squared as here. So this uh, is this 11 third is a uh, 5 third minus 2. Uh, here, there is, this is different, and this spectrum would always be flat. That's an important difference having to do with the fact that this one is not uh, white noise, but it's actually a blue noise. I will not go into such details here. But, uh, but let me just say that, uh, that there is a fair chance that all these magnetic stresses could be well, could lead to a spectra that are well above the LISA um, 
detective, uh, detectability limits, sensitivity limits. So here are cases where if the magnetic energy density is about 10% of the critical magnetic energy density, and we call that spectrum omega per unit uh, logarithmic frequency interval, uh, would be clearly above the detectability limit and perhaps even larger than that. So uh, what we obtained back then was that there is a connection between gravitational wave energy and the input energy, uh, which is the um, which is magnetic energy most uh, most in our cases. Depending on various scenarios for acoustic turbulence, we obtain typically a somewhat more efficient generation for the same energy input. We uh, found typically more gravitational wave energy. And uh, we are in the process of understanding what exactly is behind it. And it has to do with the particular time dependence in acoustic turbulence, hydrodynamic turbulence in this case. So here are just a few more experiments with uh, different simulations that we are doing right at the moment, uh, where we calculate the corresponding gravitational wave energy for different uh, scenarios uh, with magnetic genesis, magnetogenesis by the chiromagnetic effect. So we can have some scenarios where depending on the diffusivity, these are all lines where the diffusivity increases, uh, we have uh, certain trajectories here or certain uh, uh, tracks in, in this parametric representation where depending on the in amount of energy, so here is just 1% of the critical energy density, you can reach uh, already uh, values of the gravitational wave energy that begin to become interesting and perhaps even more so as we continue this plot. So uh, the hope is not uh, quite over that the chiral magnetic effect may also produce uh, observationally relevant uh, gravitational waves. Uh, here, let me advertise one paper with uh, Tina Kachniashvili just a few, uh, two, two weeks ago, where we calculated the circular polarization of these gravitational waves, and we obtained almost 100% uh, circular polarization for a fully helical magnetic field. And we would expect a fully helical magnetic field and even facts, uh, facts of the inverse cascade as all, is all explained in detail in this recent archive paper. So with that, uh, oh, I have here a few more visualizations. Actually, this one is a nice one. So normally uh, one of course put, uh, explains this polarization in terms of these two cross polarization and plus polarization. Circular polarization, what it actually means is that the root A, that the plane is actually rotating as a function of time. So let me just show you this. So this polarization plane is just rotating. I think my animation is a bit slow sometimes. Uh, but if I uh, now also look at the, so this is just a bubble. And we would not be actually able to see the circular polarization in the universe until we were actually able to see the full spatial dependence. Because at, at positions, uh, at different positions in the solar system, if you had a LISA configuration a little bit away from the Earth, for example, you would see a corresponding wobble, but shifted in phase. And with that information, you could potentially observe uh, circular polarization in the early universe. So with that, I have uh, stretched enough of your time, and I would like to uh, uh, conclude here by saying that magnetic helicity is an important quantity. It's um, in, uh, nearly perfectly conserved in usual hydrodynamics. It, uh, is, uh, it, it leads to uh, uh, catastrophic quenching in periodic boxes, which has uh, led to a headache of some people in the hydrodynamics community back then. Uh, but it also leads to inverse cascading um, uh, in such a way that we can draw conclusions about the energy density even at the present time, because the helicity that was produced early on would be exactly the same what we would have even nowadays. And it can also lead uh, to gravitational waves uh, that would be fully circularly polarized, 100% circularly polarized, at, uh, at certain frequencies, uh, and those would be detectable by LISA, we would hope. So with that, uh, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, would be happy to answer additional questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a very nice presentation. Now let's go to questions. Uh, I think we have the first question uh, from Henry. Go ahead. Henry De Jong. Hi. Uh, I'd like to know uh, what your research can say about the uh, helicity of the magnetic fields in terms of like, say, the bipolar mass and energy uh, ejections of quasars. Yeah. Um, 
I have not looked into uh, uh, that in particular, but it's just a little bit similar to um, uh, the helicity that I've been uh, discussing in connection with the sun. Um, so based on dimensional arguments, I think one can uh, just do a back of the envelope calculation by um, by looking at the magnetic energy density and uh, and a typical, and I think that's actually it. We, we, we would basically have a flux squared so we can calculate the the, uh, the the flux in each hemisphere of a of the of the system that actually produces uh, the quasar itself, the accretion disk. We can calculate in the northern hemisphere separately from the southern hemisphere the magnetic helicity or the magnetic energy first of all, and based on that we can estimate the flux, which is uh, uh, just the modulus of b. On in principle, it's b, but we, when, as a matter of estimate, one can take the modulus. Um, and uh, multiply this by the cross-sectional area of the accretion disk in, in latitude. And uh, based on that, you can obtain a flux. And um, the magnetic helicity that you could be shed and would be shed, and I would expect a nearly perfect uh, shedding of magnetic helicity. That's why we are, why real astrophysicists is not in a periodic box, of course. Uh, magnetic helicity is being shed. It could just be estimated by this taking this flux squared. And so one would just uh, need to estimate here uh, what we have in terms of uh, B and uh, surface area. You get a flux in Maxwell's, and then you calculate Maxwell squared, and you have your quantity. So I think it would be uh, uh, quite a bit, actually. And of course, it is. A, we know that it can uh, already lead to seeding uh, clusters of galaxies by the by by, by the many different uh, quasars that would be shedding magnetic energy and helicity. But then of different signs, of course. So the cluster would not have a net helicity. Does that answer your question? Yes, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question, Sanjay already, please. Hi, hey, thanks for a nice talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think Thank I you. may have missed uh, something you said about the time scale for the inverse cascade. My understanding is that if you want to generate large scale magnetic fields, starting with some mechanism that produces an initial chiral imbalance or gives you an initial mu five, there's a competition between the time scale associated with uh, spin flips, which is trying to get rid of uh, the initial mu five and the time scale for the inverse cascade to somehow take that initial mu yes. five and turn it into so we have two. we have estimated that actually in our up j letter paper of 2017 uh, the spin flip rate um, in the early universe at uh, i mean the, it is comparable on the on the scale of the hubble horizon it would be uh, comparable however the current magnetic effect really acts on small length scales to begin with and uh, on those small length scales where the instability happens, uh, I think spin flipping, there was a factor of either 700 or 7,000. I forget now exactly what, what number it was. Uh, we would be safe. Um, so the spin flipping would not affect uh, the uh, early, early part of the instability. Yeah. And once, uh, once you have to, so you would be able to turn all this uh, chirality into, uh, into magnetic fields. Uh, that would then propagate to larger and larger length scales, and then you don't have to worry about spin flipping yeah. anymore. Thanks. I, but I'm trying to understand what is the physics that sets the time scale for the inverse cascade? Oh, uh, I um, suspect I missed it. Yes, these are the dynamical time scales. Uh, so I remember I showed you a power law. So it goes like t to the minus uh, two thirds. Uh, yes, this, it was, um, it was uh, here. Energy is proportional to t to the minus two third power. So that happens on a dynamical uh, time scale. So it, it would be, a, uh, and it, uh, so it depends then. Uh, actually, another nice plot here. If I go, well, let's see, if I go to a page, oh, I have lost here my screen sharing. Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, let's go to page, yeah, this one. So uh, a useful way of explaining this would be to, to plot the change of the magnetic field, which would decay uh, as a function of the length scale, which would increase. Uh, so as a function of time, it would increase from small length scales to larger and larger length scales. And uh, we know roughly uh, the time that we have, uh, namely uh, approximately, uh, I think it's 12 orders of magnitude in time, that would correspond to eight orders of magnitude in length scale here. Uh, which is what is plotted here, eight orders of magnitude in length scale, between the time of the electroweak phase transition, uh, 
and the time of recombination. So that gives us 12 orders of magnitude in time, and that corresponds to eight orders of magnitude in length scale. And so for a fully helical magnetic field, there would be a decay, uh, which uh, would be along this line. Uh, and so it would decay in this case, if it was uh, fully helical and had was uh, close to one microgauss in uh, co-moving units, in the units of today, uh, it would decay down to a nano nanogauss magnetic fields, but not from the chiral magnetic effect. This would be from a hypothetic uh, mag magnetogenesis effect that is more efficient than the chiral magnetic effect. The chiral magnetic effect would be approximately down here. Uh, it would go along the same line, but would be below that, and this is here the uh, Fermi limit from the non-observations of secondary GV photons. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question, Oleg Turaev. Oleg? Hello? Mm -hmm. Thanks, I, I have a question concerning the gauge invariance. Uh, while in hydrohelicity uh, velocities uh, are you breaking up or are you breaking? We, we cannot the hear you well. So the vector potential is not. Yes. And yes. while the time. Uh, what okay, let me explain the oh. gauge, uh, gauge dependence here. So I, it is. I can, I can, yeah, yeah, just a question about the gauge dependence because for yeah, hyper yeah. helicity velocity is observable yeah. and just, so magnetic uh, magne magnetic helicity is uh, uh, formally gauge dependent, but if the volume is, is an infinite one or yeah, a periodic yeah. a periodic one is gauge independent. Yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah. So, so periodicity plays yes. a role. Yes, yes. So that I, indeed uh, is a uh, is a bit of a complication. Um, in open domains, and therefore, in the case when we have helicity fluxes from domains, it does indeed play a role. And uh, uh -huh. and indeed, there are some fair questions to be answered. Uh -huh. uh, I should also say that when we do numerical simulations, we are always working with A. So as far as I'm concerned, uh -huh. um, uh, I'm evolving A in the numerical simulations, and I have set boundary conditions on A. And then uh -huh. A dot B in, in that gauge, of course, is a well-defined thing. Then I, conceptually, it's easy to work with that. But I do understand that if you wanted to detect it um, observationally, for example, you run into problems, of course. And, and, and you are choosing some particular gauge, right? For, for, I, uh, for numerical simulations, I'm using the Weyl gauge. So I that see. means that dA by dt is equal to minus E, the electric uh -huh. field. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's a, a very simple uh, gauge and, uh -huh. uh, and actually the best one, I would think. There's mm -hmm. other gauges which can be uh, can have conceptual advantages, but uh, yes, uh, there's a lot to be talked about. And uh, also just look at some of my literature. There's a 2011 paper mm -hmm. relevant mm -hmm. to this question, mm -hmm. by, led by Candela okay. Rizzi. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we had a comment from Kohei Kamada. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So the, I'd like to give a comment on the, the spin flip interaction, but the, the, so the, the, I think actually you consider the case saying the mu five is, is the order of, of the, the temperature. But, but the, so comparing the spin flip interaction and the Hubble, Hubble expanded rate, the, the, uh, it has been shown that the, 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 the if the, the, the if the, the, the initial initial in, in, initial color, color chemical potential mu five mu five over t is Larger than ten to the minus four, so at third, then the yes. the the, the plasma instability can grow before the, the spin flip interaction become the effective. That's a comment. Yes, yes, I uh, that, that agrees. I think with what we had in our FJ letter paper. Yeah. So that, that, uh, that's you could perhaps look at look at that. Uh, I think that we mentioned the number of seven hundred or, or even seven thousand, uh, by which we would be safe uh, as far as instability is concerned. Yeah. I see there's another question in the chat uh, saying that uh, the gauge dependence is uh, physical. Um, yeah. But, yeah, but you want to speak it but, up? Yeah, but I couldn't already answer. I mean, if you if you add a gradient, um, then you buy, uh, self, then the term that you would get uh, is equal to, um, is, is, is because the divergence of B is equal to zero, and perhaps you know that, of course, uh, because the divergence of B is uh, zero, 
uh, the, the integral becomes just equal to uh, phi times the uh, the surface integral of phi times uh, times b, and so again for if there is no surface surface term, uh, this would be absent. That's the best I can say about this. So the uh, for for homogeneous uh, for homogeneous conditions. Uh, I don't think there is a, actually a problem, it, but it is dependent on the homogeneity. So what you could, inf of course, imagine, yes, due to boundaries, what you could imagine is, of course, uh, a situation where the universe is uh, uh, non-uniform, that you might have uh, positive helicity, negative helicity in different places, then you would have helicity fluxes between the two. Those fluxes would still be physical, and there's arguments also for why they are physical, but um, but indeed, there is a formal gauge problem in those cases. But this uh, uh, would only be the case if you're talking about uh, large-scale uh, large homo inhomogeneous in systems. Um, OK, I don't see any other, other questions. But concerning this thing, I'm a bit con uh, confused. Uh, some people seem to imply that you need to make a physical meaning out of helicity density. That's not really required. You really just need the total helicity as an integrated quantity. And of course, you could only define separately in the regions where the boundary conditions are such that the magnetic fields, for example, go, I think, what is it, parallel to the surface or something like this. So yeah. in that case, you could define isolated regions. But generically, it's a topologically global quantity. So you don't really need to worry about the density, I assume. Yeah, uh, but we can actually still do that. So when I do my numerical simulations, of course, uh, then A dot B uh, is actually spatially also uniform, uh, at least uh, to a pretty, bad, pretty good approximation. So that was, that's what I meant. Once, uh, once, however, you have a system where you have a modulation, a large scale modulation of, uh, of a local A dot B in, in any gauge, uh, then you would have fluxes. And those fluxes wouldn't get themselves be gauge dependent. Uh, and again, it would lead to physical effects. Uh, but if you want to describe them, yeah, you have a uh, you have to um, make a decision about which gauge you want to communicate in, if you want to right. compare with somebody else. Yeah. So in solar physics, uh, there is a big uh, body of literature since 1984 and 85. Uh, there's a paper by Mitch Berger and uh, and George Field, a uh, very important one of 84 which developed certain concepts for calculating gauge invariant uh, helicities. That's is, is a helicity based on some reference field. So that again is a different um, concept. I don't uh, like that that much, uh, be, uh, but um, yeah, look at some of my other papers where we do talk about magnetic helicity fluxes. It turns out that um, in, in cases where you can average in time, um, you can again be safe uh, that in the sense that um, in that case, the uh, time derivative of the helicity is gauge independent. It's actually zero if you average over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have a gauge independent term and a gauge dependent flux divergence. Uh, but because one is gauge independent manifestly, also the divergence of the flux, helicity flux, must be gauge independent under those circumstances, either after time averaging or, or, or the assumption of statistical stationarity. So that's uh, more, more the concept that I like to talk about. OK, so let's see. Uh, any other questions from the audience before we will uh, wrap this up? I see an, at least a, a number of um, familiar faces here, like, uh, like um, Gordon is still online, of course. And Atanmay is back from his appointment, which is nice to see. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, uh, um, and Dimitri Kazeev is also online. How did you find out about this? Well, uh, good to see you uh, all. Uh, great to see you, Axel. Yeah, thank great. you. Great to see you. <laughs> anyway, I, I cannot let it, this go before first thanking our speaker, Axel, for a very nice presentation. It was uh, very nice of you to go into all these details and explain everything uh, from basic principles. So thank you very much. I really oh, it appreciate was, it. was a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Igor, for inviting me to this very wonderful seminar. I've been looking and uh, attending many of these already. So it was always a great pleasure. Yeah.